Yearning to play a few rounds of Gwent, that ought to set me straight. It's Commander's Horn, episode 75. Today we have a competitive panel here. I'm joined by Gwent Open number three participants, LB Dutch Boy and Demorcus. We're going to be talking about all the goings on in the world of Gwent, the meta, and also about high level tournament preparation. Join us for all of this on this episode of Commander's Horn. Good afternoon, friends. It is March 27th, 2018, a great day for your weekly Gwent podcast. I am Dane McBeard, and today I'm joined by two players making names for themselves, LB Dutch Boy and Demarcus. Welcome to the cast, gentlemen. Yo, thank you for having us, man. Good evening. So, uh, as noted already in the chat by my good friend and friend of the show and participant on the show, Grey Boxer, there are even less beards in this podcast than the last one, which featured <laughs> two female guests. Uh, because I've shaved, so don't be alarmed, everybody who's watching this on video. Uh, my friends, the beard will grow back. Um, so, uh, and it's funny because when you guys last saw me, I had probably the biggest beard I've ever had in my life. So I'm sure this is probably a shock to you as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's quite impressive. <laughs> quite impressive. Um, so let's dig into the news, but I wanted to ask you guys just straight up right away. How was your trip to Poland? Was it your first time in Poland, Dutch boy? Yeah, it was for me. and It was really cool as well. Like, just getting to meet everyone behind the scene and all the players there. Mm -hmm. Like, the Gwen scene is really cool and all the players are really nice to each other. I was pleasantly surprised. Excellent. Demarcus, what about you? Now, you, you are, you're fluent in Polish, so you've definitely spent some time in Poland. Yeah, I'm a Polish veteran. I uh, spent uh, 10 years, my first 10 years in Poland, mm -hmm. in the south of Poland, and then I moved to Germany. So uh, it wasn't my first time there. Uh, but uh, I definitely enjoyed it, and I loved the fact that uh, when you um, when you go to a gaming competition, and you know do those people play the pro letter for several hours a day, mm -hmm. you uh, you're kind of curious how the people are in real life. And uh, I was really surprised that everyone was uh, super open-minded, extroverted, not the typical stereotype of a uh, pro gamer you would expect. It was great. I mean, it's true. Like I've, because I've gotten to know a lot of these guys and girls uh, uh, throughout. I guess how long has it been now? It's almost a year. I guess in in well in in January I went to Poland for the first time last year, but since we actually started doing the pro events in May in Challenger, actually like being involved with all you know the community and everything and the actual players, um, I would say that uh, it is it is definitely more real, I guess, because, you know, I come from I come from a background where I actually watched a lot of esports. I wasn't really involved in them. So I had the idea I know what these people are like. And, you know, they seem like seem like game playing robots sometimes. But no, we are all human beings. We are not just here for the games, but we definitely were there for the games in Poland. Also, Demorcus, you're currently in Poland right now on vacation. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I like to open so much. I decided to uh, go to vacation to Poland instantly because I haven't had enough of the Polish food that I so uh, so much uh, promoted in my uh, intro video at the open. And yeah, I'm here at the Polish coast and I'm enjoying my holiday. Right on. Um, so, of course, if, if for some reason you follow Gwent but you do not know, both LB Dutch Boy and Demorcus were participants in the most recent Gwent Open number three, alongside, Ad alongside I should say, Adzikov, Tailbot, uh, oh, who is that? This, uh, Hannah Chan, uh, Shamel, uh, Pronio, and finally, who's my last? Colomon, of course, Colomon. And so many of those people are going to Challenger as well. Uh, yep. In fact, so many of them were going to Challenger. <laughs> it was actually really interesting how the slots lined up. But we'll talk about all that in the news. Um, but just before we just kind of dig into that, I just wanted to ask you guys, since Challenger is coming up, um, you have uh, had a taste of the competitive scene. You've been to CDPR PR Studios for Gwent Open. How are you preparing for your next chance at a CD Project Red event? Dutch Boy, how, what are you doing right now? Are you still taking a break, maybe? High exposure well, to Gwent? at the moment, I am starting to try streaming for a bit. I'm kind of like in the middle of not being sure whether I prefer streaming or playing pro letter. 
the <laughs> meta is kind of boring for me right now because it's already been the same meta for so long that mm-hmm. I don't enjoy playing six hours a day, the same deck over and over again. But we'll have to see. I'm really actually kind of stoked to push myself to it, mm-hmm. but I've not, not yet been able to do it. And you said you're giving tre- streaming a shot, and you said just before we got started that streaming's very hard. What's the hardest part about it, playing Gwent and streaming at the same time? Well, it's like you have so many things to focus on, because normally when you play Gwent, you already have a million things on your mind or all the small interactions that are going on, but now you also have that plus the chat that's going on and all the people that are watching you and the extra pressure of not fucking up really badly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When you fuck up normally, it's, uh, I don't normally swear on the podcast. Uh, when oh, you screw exactly. up, when you screw up normally, uh, uh, usually it's only you and your opponent that knows. And maybe if you really have a lot of finesse, your opponent doesn't even know. But yes, when, when hundreds of people can potentially, potentially know, it is a little, a little traumatizing. Uh, Demarcus, how about you? How are you preparing for the next challenge or preparing for the next event, I guess? Well, um, first I have to kind of um, find a good spot to uh, grind the product again. Mm-hmm. So I, uh, when I came back, I tried to play a few matches and I had the uh, impossible luck of uh, queuing with boats into Imler Saba for six times during one day. So I decided that it's enough <laughs> it's a lot of <laughs> and uh, took a short break. But um, yeah, mm-hmm. I started playing today and uh, it was a good day. So I think I will uh, prepare with my team a lot and um, try to um, find the best strategy again, the best moments to push. And mm-hmm. I'm optimistic that I can uh, do it again. And that is Team Eratuza, to be specific for everybody listening. Team Eratuza is the team that... Now, did you form the team, Demorcus? Mm, I think... Um, I entered the team when it was still a playtesting group, mm-hmm. um, so it uh, found its origin in early summer of the last year, and it was still a playtesting group for people, for people interested in competing in Gwent. And when I entered the group, I uh, saw kind of the potential it had and decided to approach Henotje. Uh, the leader back then Mm -hmm. and uh, together we have um, built up the team and to its current state and became more and more competitive and shaped in the current scene that's cool i want to talk to you about that a little bit later as well uh maybe just after we talk about a little bit of gwen news that hit us i also want to let you all know that this episode of commander's horn is live recorded on twitch on my channel twitch.tv slash mcbearded you can find all episodes of commander's horn at commandershorn.com and you can subscribe on itunes stitcher and other podcasting apps send your emails to commander's horn podcast at gmail.com or tweet at us at commander's horn and this is a very fitting fake ad because you were just talking about how you don't like when your boats get beat up. Uh, this week's show is brought to you by our sponsor, uh, sponsor Imlaris Mixed Martial Arts Fighting Academy, Jiu-Jitsu, Muay Thai, Krav Maga. Whatever it is, he'll teach you to fight like that. But of course, I'm kidding. Uh, this, uh, this episode is actually and always brought to you by uh, our commandos. Commando! Our patrons at patreon.com slash commander's horn. Thanks so much for keeping the lights on and keeping the podcast ad free. Uh, so we do have some stuff to talk about, of course. Uh, there was uh, some news and we did take the week off last week. So we're going to take a quick break and uh, we're going to chat about some of the goings on in the Gwent universe. And of course, we appreciate your patience in the week that we uh, were unexpectedly taking off. Uh, so, of course, we have a little bit to cover because it's been two weeks of news. So, uh, most importantly, since, gentlemen, I figure since we, you are part of this, it's obviously a good piece of news to cover. Um, we're talking about Gwent Challenger coming up. It's going to be coming up at the end of the 28th. Uh, so, we know who's going to be there. Uh, and uh, we found out all of the placements for these players uh, around the uh, just well, actually, it was just this weekend we found out about the last player, uh, I apologize, who qualified through the challenger. Now, Dutch boy, you've been part of a chal- you've been part of a qualifier before. Um, Demarcus, I believe you probably have also been. You you attempted the qualifier last time it happened in February. Did you both? Um, I couldn't participate because mm. I had uh, my brother's event. But uh, next time I will. <laughs> and Dutch boy, did you competed in the qualifier? At that point, did you know what your chances were to get the Gwent Open? Uh, so yeah, I competed on it and actually finished first on the first day, mm-hmm. but my chances right. were still a bit slim. 
since uh, people like Game King and Shaggy at that point were starting to push, and my score was basically just not quite there yet, so I still had to push a lot for Pro Layer 2. So it was actually kind of close for me to whether I would uh, want to compete in a qualifier or not. Still, going undefeated in the Swiss was that's pretty impressive. Uh, uh, I think I'm trying to remember all the people that have done that before. I know Michael from Top Tech has done it before, but it. Uh, uh, I, I I went seven one. Oh, Didn't you went seven one. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Sorry, I should know this. No worries. No <laughs> it was worries. a bit of time ago. It was a bit of time ago because this is February, right? Um, and then yeah. the most recent Challenger qualifier just completed with I apologize uh, taking it. It came pretty close to some people actually. Uh, uh, I know Vishra and Shinmiri were up near the end as well. Shinmiri, part of Team Maratuza as well. So um, it was close. It was close for your team. Uh, it was close for uh, my buddy Vishra as well. But I apologize. Looking forward to meeting him. An Australian finalist, the first that we've seen in Pro Gwent. Joining I apologize will be the winner of Challenger 2, Freddie Babes, Super JJ, and Atsikovs, the finalist from Open Number 3, JJ being the winner. Hannah Chan and Tailbot, finalist from Open Number 4. Hannah Chan being the winner, but Tailbot already qualified through the qualifier, which made these spots up in the air. Colomon gets Colomon gets there from crown points, and Shamel actually gets there on crown points as a result of the outcome of your match with Hannah Chan, Dutch boy, I believe. So yep. if you had advanced, Hannah Chan would have gotten it, and Shamel would have just not been involved. Um, so it's interesting how it comes down to the fine, fine little details when it comes to organizing these events. And uh, yeah, and that would be, those are the eight people that are going to be there. We're going to be down in the salt mine. And of course, we'll be covering that a little bit closer to the event. Um, how do you, I'm actually curious about this. Um, how do you feel about faction battles affecting the meta? Uh, because we just had a faction battle pass, Henselt and Monsters. Sorry, I said Northern Realms and Monsters. <laughs> I mean, that was a Freudian slip. You, got, you know what I meant, but Henselt obviously being very dominant when Northern Realms faction battle is active. How do you feel it actually affects the meta for you guys? Dutch Boy, do you, feel, do you see a difference? Uh, yeah, there's actually a big difference. The amount of like Henselts and Dagons that suddenly pop up when the faction challenge is live on Pro Letter is kind of mm -hmm. crazy. You just have to get attuned to it. Since for most people, Pro Letter is kind of casual in a way. Because the pro leader is pretty useless to play in, in, mm -hmm. in unless you can actually qualify for the top eight. Mm -hmm. So then people start just playing it there and having fun. But you still have to win against all these people. And Hansel isn't a bad deck in any way, mm -hmm. as well as Dagon. So you can no longer play like Skoytel, for example, then. Yeah, and even though, like, I mean, a lot of people meme on the pro ladder. I have been on the pro ladder, and I've memed myself. <laughs> but it is, um, it is fun for people, I guess, to cut queue into a potential show match with one of the best players in the world because it doesn't seem like there's a lot of matchmaking involved. And unfortunately, yes, these players are good enough to get to the pro ladder. But still, you do know that the top, uh, it's, what is it like? You'd say the top like five percent, ten percent actually are really pushing at any given time. Uh, Demarcus, what's your view on the pro ladder and how people approach it and how, um, I guess. I mean, we're gonna. I actually have this as a conversation later, but I figure it's kind of organic to talk about it now. So, mm, I mean, regarding the faction changes, I think they're um, kind of a great idea mm -hmm. uh, to um, introduce to the game. But I think they um, are not such a great idea to take place on the pro letter mm -hmm. because um, it kind of shifts the entire meta and forces people to play. Uh, in an uh, uh, environment that is uh, very frequently leading to mirrors. And if it's one, if there's one thing that you don't like about Gwent, it's playing mirrors, mm -hmm. because uh, that's where you get uh, really unhappy about the game. But uh, apart from that, I think, um, I mean, I like to check faction changes. Um, and uh, of course, if they, when they are being introduced, they completely uh, shift the uh, percentages of the factions in the pro leader. I don't think it's really great. I would mm -hmm. rather prefer them to be on your on ranked. Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting because I like you know any content or any sort of uh, any sort of events that happen for Gwent to keep things fresh. But uh, this it's, this just kind of feels like you know a long version of a quest, like win five games as monsters. It just feels like people go on <laughs> these journeys, and it's just you know the people you can tell the people who are either not involved in it or I mean. You got the monster. The monster title was a new thing, but you could have gotten the bo the border the hard way against Nilfgaard um, way back in one of the first or the second faction challenge. But um, yeah, it's just it's an interesting thing. I feel like maybe there's probably a way to do it. Hopefully, that doesn't affect um, the overall gaming experience because it does create a lot of mirrors, and I personally don't enjoy mirrors. Um, I like when the game is diverse as possible. So I'm sure most people would agree with that. 
Yeah. Finally, I haven't had the chance to earn uh, not even one of the faction challenges borders. I don't have actually a single one of them because every time a faction challenge came up, I tried to find a really good deck that countered all of them <laughs> and uh, spammed this on the pro ladder. So I've actually never got to achieve any of the uh, uh, of the faction challenge uh, frames. You're more you're more worried about farming the people who are trying. Yeah. <laughs> ah, it's evil. It's evil. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's. I do like that they have these borders in there, and uh, but uh, it's true when you can predict the meta. I mean, a lot of the time, a lot of Gwent takes place in the deck builder. So uh, if you can expect something, maybe some streamers playing something popular, or there's a faction challenge, you can tailor your your day's gameplay for around that. Um, more stuff happened at the Open, though. There was the studio tour. Now, you guys were obviously uh, very involved with the event, but did you get a chance to catch the studio tour when they showed it? I did not. No? I, I wanted to, but I only got a glimpse of the CDPR headquarters, which was amazing, but mm. sadly I couldn't see anything, everything. And um, when you guys went in to do your, your, um, your videos and stuff like that, uh, what was involved there? Because you were out there in the old town of Poland, and did you get a, a better look at CDPR at any given time? Demarcus, did you get any, uh, any, um, any look there? I mean, not a very detailed one. Mm -hmm. We uh, went upstairs uh, for a while, and uh, we had a chance to look a bit, in, a bit into it, but uh, we didn't get any kind of uh, big tour. I, I mm -hmm. guess we have to, uh, to insist on that next time. But uh, yeah, I, I thought uh, from what I've seen, I was really happy to see all the nice arts on the walls mm -hmm. and the Vernon Rush art and stuff. I was uh, desperately trying to find an Artusa art. So oh, I could right. uh, find something for the team, but unfortunately there was nothing to see. But I hope next time I will be able to spot it at a hidden spot. Yeah, there's lots of uh, there's lots of Witcher Two concept art around on the first floor, but the, most of the Gwent art is either in the Gwent team room or there's one boardroom where they have um, the leaders. And there's one original Roach card, like the one with like the old diamonds. I don't know if you guys even followed the game when yeah. it was in alpha, but like when it was in like all the old art, there's a Roach card out there as well in one of the meeting rooms. But uh, no Eratusa, though. But it's one of my favorite artworks, actually. The uh, um, the Adept, actually, is a really good one. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we well, the studio tour um, on the actual event day, Pavko Gale led, uh, led a camera crew in. We ta talked to uh, uh, the lead developer, um, some QA, of course, artist Lorenzo was in there. Um, lots of great people. Of course, Luigi was there. Got to see the Thronebreaker map. Um, I guess this is kind of a uh, question for you guys. Outside of Gwent, you guys, I'm sure, have other tastes in games. Um, Dutch Boy, we've actually played Vermintide together, so I do know that you're out there playing some some games. Are you guys excited for a game of this scope for single player Gwent? It's it's got to be. It's kind of like a meeting of the world, right? You got a really great studio that makes great single player content, and then mashing it together with this game that you spend so many hours on. Uh, it looks like it's going to be a huge game if the map looks as big as like actually like Velen from Witcher Three. What do you guys think about the scope of single player? I mean, anything Witcher related, bring it on. Mm -hmm. I, I love it. I love the first game. I love the second game, the third one even more. And I can't get enough of it. So I really hope um, it offers a lot to play and I won't be finished with it very soon. Mm -hmm. uh, Dutch Boy, were you introduced uh, to Gwent through The Witcher or did you just get, get introduced to it through, I guess, card game buzz? Uh, because it, I find that... Um, the people that come into Gwent can come from card game fans or just Witcher fans, and it and the Witcher exposed like a whole new audience to potentially playing card games. So I'm curious. I ask everybody, how did you get into Gwent? Um, so yeah, I already played it on The Witcher Three, and actually found it somehow on the internet one day and tried it out and kind of liked it way more than Hearthstone back in the day. Mm -hmm. So I just found it on the interweb somewhere. I was already familiar with card games, so. I didn't get new, I wasn't new to the genre, but Gwent was still something very special to begin with. Yeah, it is. And I was, um, since, you know, a lot of people are talking about Magic the Gathering right now, um, which is a game that's been solidified for like 25 years at this point. Uh, I have had a lot of discussion with people about how Gwent is doing something with a card game that's like unlike every other card game by like large margins, like big sweeping differences in Gwent and other card games. And a lot of people, uh, you know, maybe were brought up playing card games of old or came over from other card games. But Gwent, was, I think, is always going to still offer a really unique experience. And I think single player is not going to be any different. 
So I'm personally also very excited for Thronebreaker. And, uh, you know, the challenge is a pretty big stage. Maybe they're going to talk about something. I would like to hope that it's coming soon uh, as well. Um, the final thing, I guess, uh, that's worth talking about is that uh, Powell Burza was quoted uh, more or less in an AMA that they did on the CD Projekt Red forums that RNG might get toned down in ranked play and certain cards may be restricted to the arena. Demarcus, you're already you're already <laughs> praising this decision. How do you feel about the... Uh, so, I mean, we're talking about stuff like maybe Elven Scouts, Slave Driver, Runestones, perhaps. Uh, basically, like, I guess as competitors, just give me your take on how you feel about RNG right now um, and the tournament scene. Do you think that there's bigger things to worry about or do you think this is a very important thing to address? It is a very important thing to address, definitely, because, uh, I mean... Um, Gwent lives from the fact that as a competitive player, you can really dive deep into the game, think about the placement of your cards, the the order, the like what what cards do you hit, how do you structure them, when do you pass, and something, and then you have these cards that uh, kind of make everything. Uh, uh, not calculable anymore, like Runestone, mm. like Elven Scout, and then you have these games that you you really think your game plan through. You invest every turn, you rope like Shin Miri every turn mercilessly <laughs> till the end, and then you 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 really think it through, and then your opponent draws, uh, I know, Raihat Dragoon Farsia, and then you you think, like, oh, guess I'm out of the game. It's over, and uh, I, I really hate when it happens, and it it kind of uh destroys my fun the game of i mean i think that uh, there is an argument to 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 the cards that i mean to, those cards the create cards make the game more into more fun more surprising but mm -hmm. actually like i think the, the fun is taking away when i lose and i can't do anything about it that's like the worst feeling in any card game or in any game where you lose the game and you you were not able to just win it that mm -hmm. that's not how it's supposed to be so i really love the idea and i hope to see some card disappear so i can finally play square 10 in peace dutch boy what's your take on it that's a very good so, answer by the way to mark it's very passionate <laughs> that's why i want to hear your side yeah i mean cards like elva scout and slave drivers are just really shitty to play against and also to play themselves because it always feels like someone is going to be sad after it's going to happen <laughs> yeah but the thing that I'm most scared about the, when they remove the create cards is that the game is going to be stale to watch again. If you remember the uh, first Gwen Slams over at Life Coaches mansion, mm -hmm. the game was at a certain point really boring to watch because it was all about you have golden weather, the guy has the golden weather answer, okay, that's game. Mm -hmm. Do you have the answer, yes or no? Well, I guess we can go to the next game. And create stopped that from happening, which was really good. To uh, for the tournament twice to watch, but mm -hmm. not to play in. So they'll have to find some kind of balance in between. Yeah, it's it's really interesting because uh, you know as a caster, uh, I've talked about this with my other fellow casters before. Before it got before create cards were introduced, um, we would look at a game state in maybe a medium length round three. And, you know, for the most part, we knew how it was going to go, but we can't just call the winner there and then wait 10 minutes for the gameplay to finish. So adding the RNG takes those experiences away. Like, you know, you're playing, I don't know, you're playing Black Blood and you get Hubert and it just happens that you have enough boosts in your deck for some, for some reason. Like, I don't know, uh, Neckers or, of course, Northern Realms or just for some weird example. Um, yeah. and you don't really expect that to happen and it's a big surprise and it's this huge cathartic moment um, and I think that that's kind of like moments are what you're looking for with RNG but in practice there are moments and then there are like the 99 like out of 100 moments there's like one truly great moment and then there's 99 other moments where somebody just feels really crappy <laughs> about the whole thing and yeah, exactly. uh, it reminds me of, an orig of a discussion I think way, 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 way back when I used to play League of Legends, this is like pre Hearthstone or anything. Uh, the concept was introduced by the devs, I think, when they were updating the game of anti fun. And I know this is something that is like, it's a term that's thrown around a lot where when people just aren't having fun, they think it's anti fun. But that's not really anti fun. What anti fun is when you do something that feels fine, you know, you could take it or leave it. Like you roll Elven Scout, ah, eh, you know, it's okay. I'll take whatever it gives me. But it feels terrible for the other person. So like your happiness from hitting Elven Scout isn't as 
uh, isn't as uh, weighted as the disappointment that your opponent feels when it doesn't go properly. Uh, so, and they use mana drains as, a, as an example where when you mana drain your opponent, like whatever, but they can't do anything at all and it's the worst feeling in the world. So introducing, introducing luck into a game like this and introducing these mechanics and still trying to keep the game fun for all people involved is a really trickery, tricky uh, slope to, to climb. Sorry, I, I monologued that a little bit. Um, no worries, man. But that's just what I think about when I think about RNG because it's a card game. There's always going to be draws. There's always going to be like, ah, here's a question actually for you guys. Uh, Demarcus, how do you feel about Dijkstra, um, past and present? Because that card is, that card I, I feel like is a poster boy for an RNG card that is controllable and predictable enough, but still wild enough that it's like a great tournament card, a good card for most decks, um, but is still very heavily random. How do you feel about D, uh, Dijkstra? I think it's. Um, I think that describing this card as random is uh, is kind of appropriate, and at the same time, it's not because um, if you think about what Dijkstra is actually doing, he's pulling two cards from your deck, right? And uh, yeah. of course, the cards can be bad and they can be good, but it's just like you would simply draw two cards in within like the Mulligan phase, and it's. Uh, I think it's a very healthy card because it's basically just incentivizing you to play a deck that um, uh, makes your top decks, top draws consistent. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's, uh, I don't see a problem with this card. I think it's, of course, it's RNG, but mm -hmm. it's the typical draw RNG. So it's involved in every card game. How about you, Dutch Boy? I mean, I, I just feel like it's a good example, but I also would extend the question to something like Tris Telekinesis, which has been, uh, which has been added to the game and is, is arguably the best card that was added from that set of five, t a set of 10 by a large margin. Not really random, but still random in, in a way. It's obviously, it's walking a line where it's everybody's more or less okay with this card. But if it was, if it was create any bronze spell, it would be, it would be a totally different story. Where is it okay? Like, where do you think it could be okay, Dutch boy? Uh, so yeah, like you said yourself, it's a very difficult road to walk mm -hmm. to get good RNG cards into the game. Uh, like I said, with Dijkstra, same can be said for Vilgeforts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. These cards are pretty good. The decks that are being played in know what uh, top decks are most likely going to be with stuff like Kahir or in the old Spy list, you thin down so much that you knew what you were going to get from Vilgevorts. I didn't like the change they did with cards like Roach. Mm. The, the ability to draw Roach of Vilgevorts is just kind of stupid. But other than that, those cards are totally fine, and Triss is also a totally fine card right now because it's it says RNG, but it isn't really RNG. You choose kind of in the deck building process what you're gonna take, and sometimes you can actually take something else. For example, if you're playing uh, Triss in a Skellige veteran deck or mm. uh, Great Swords at the moment, there's a good amount of the time where I um, bleed the Hensel down so much in round one that I Triss into Winch just because I cannot recon yet for the Freyas. Yeah. And that's fine. That's decision making in the game that you can choose and alter without really RNGing into the. Like, you know it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. It should happen. Yeah, so that's yeah cool. I would agree. Controlled randomness, see, your, see for yourself, says in the chat. Um, and like the idea that it's... like you can get ointment from Triss as monsters yeah. and bring a ghoul back. And that's mm -hmm. like a cool thing you can do in the alchemy matchup, but not in any other matchup specifically. It's funny that you brought exactly Triss Telekinesis up because. Um... I was discussing this card today with Andy Wand, and we have had mixed feelings about it mm. because um, the card for sure is one of the greatest cards introduced to Gwen so far because it's um, it's basically an RNG card, a create card that is um, fair. It feels fair. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. just uh, when you lose to Triss, I never feel betrayed. You know, that that's, <laughs> that's the kind of RNG card that you want. Yeah. But at the same time, we were thinking that... Um, I remember back to old days when weather was so oppressive that everyone had to run a griffin in monsters. And right. uh, I remember when CDPR changed the weather and they said um, that uh, they the reason why they changed it, they didn't want everyone to be forced to run a certain card to, to be able to play in the meta. And uh, the, the addition of Triss is... Uh, like has um, made so many decks more consistent that a lot of decks are running her and we were thinking if that might be problematic because she's an auto-include in Hensel, in um, 
Sometimes in Vet Skellige or Greatsword Skellige, she can be a good slot, and uh, also in uh, Bruva, she's almost an auto include by now. So, you're thinking if this is a card that is kind of uh, contradicting the incentive of uh, CDPR, but in the end, we are thinking that if uh, a card is added to many different decks, but mm -hmm. in the end, she's uh, making the decks more consistent, it is a good trade off after all. Yeah, I mean, it's true. Uh, having Triss and like Reconnaissance, I think, is like a pretty popular combo. Um, but also, like an extra Ale and Alchemy is proving to be very good as well. Um, if you play Moonlight, having an extra Moonlight is something that you can make use of. So um, I think that, yeah, it's Playwright, right? Like most cards are looked at at Playwright sometimes, just a little bit on the high side. Something needs to be done. Just because if you're, yeah, if you're not playing with a card and you feel like you're at a disadvantage, then the card is arguably too good but Triss's goodness yeah I love that she never betrays you I love that line mm. it's, uh, it's, it's really true because yeah the person who plays Triss knows what you're getting out of it and um, I don't know I, I love that card personally it's almost like I, re I don't want it to change like I'm okay with it being this good but it's possible that she's overtuned it's possible it doesn't it never really feels like about her strength value though it feels about what she's able to offer a deck I don't know a couple ways to look at it perhaps um Anyway, I want to talk to you guys about uh, your experience with uh, competitive play in general. That's going to be, that's going to be uh, taking up our strategy section right here. Um, so we're going to talk about competitive. We're going to talk about your preparation for Gwent Open 3 and um, some other stuff, of course, uh, right after this. Maybe not today and not tomorrow, but someday someone will find a way to take you down. So, Dutch Boy and Demarcus, both of you, um, you prepare for tournaments together, is that correct? Yeah, we did for the Open, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, and of course, you have uh, you have your, uh, you know, you have your, I'm assuming you have your greater team, Eretuza, on Demarcus' side, and Dutch Boy, you are part of Sector 1. How involved is that team in Gwent, and uh, uh, kind of what's the story about that? So, I was first in the Sector 1 Hearthstone team. Mm -hmm and started playing Hearthstone a little less and started becoming more interested in Gwent and actually asked them whether they were interested in a Gwent roster. Mm -hmm. And they were. So I went to the Reddits, looked for some people, and actually got some good people in my team with Lauren Till and Moody. Oh, cool. Okay. And yeah, we uh, tried to prepare together and play Pro Letter together, play tournaments and all that. We're also looking for maybe creating an own tournament um, scene. Mm -hmm. But that's still a bit rough to get going at the moment. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, we just prepared together mostly. And also for this event, I prepared together with Team Artusa. So that was really nice. It's true. So so, um, how does the prep begin, really? Like, uh, like when it comes to... Uh, so at, at, the point of, at the point of practicing, um, you practice as soon as you, I'm sure, you qualify. So you're going to be in. So now you need to look at the Open... Um, do you prepare towards a certain deadline because you know that deck lists are going to be locked? Um, do you present a strategy, talk it out? Is it more on paper? Do you just start scrimming and see what works? Uh, how does it how does it begin, uh, Demarcus? Mm, so basically, after we qualify, um, I told my team to um, make it. Basically, I asked my team to make a table of the decks that uh, they assumed that, uh, that they would have potential in a tournament setup. And we uh, analyzed uh, different arch archetypes that are uh, viable. We analyzed the matchups, how they are. And uh, what we noticed first is that it's very hard to estimate um, the strength of a deck in a tournament setting based on prolet experience. So, so we had to take a different approach on that. We uh, we started playing uh, matches against each other, uh, recorded them, and sometimes analyzed them together. And we we tried to play the games with really good players like Gwen to Town, uh, Dutch Boy, mm -hmm. Andy Wand, Octopuses, and we, we played them against each other and then we found out, oh, actually uh, this matchup is favored, I did underestimate the effect of uh, the coin flip here and so on. And uh, after we established the decks that were good on red and blue, because we instantly were adjusting toward the tournament setting, mm -hmm, right. we uh, started uh, we started looking for the right combinations. What combinations of decks would be 
uh, weak to certain arcs types. What, basically, we were thinking uh, to assemble decks that are good against a lot of other archetypes, but weak against something else, and then you would ban it. Mm -hmm. Or if you have uh, certain decks that are really good or not targetable by a certain deck that you expect to be brought. For, for us, it was alchemy. We have seen that uh, a lot of players like Adzikov, Tailbot, and also um, Prony and Chmel were really happy uh, about um, their alchemy scores. They were uh, really um, convinced of the deck. And I wasn't. Uh, like from, from the start on, I, I thought, hmm, this deck has a lot of bad matchups, actually. And so we were uh, thinking about it. And then we started adjusting our strategy towards this goal to uh, be strength, strong against alchemy. Anything to add to that, Dutch Boy? Because you guys must have come to a consensus on what was good because you ended up actually bringing the same deck list to open. I, I'm not sure if it was card for card, but I think it was card for card. Is that correct? There was Almost. one difference. There was one di <laughs> one key difference. What was the difference? The Dagon deck, he ran. I did run three Cyclops, and you ran only two, right, Dutch Boy? Yep. And I had and triple down, and he had two down. Exactly. Sorry, what was that last thing? Triple what? I had triple Dao, he had two Daos. Triple Dao, triple Cyclops. That's interesting. So actually, I'm, I'm curious. So um, first of all, how does it happen that you come to bring deck lists so similar? Is, do you reach a complete agreement on what is best? Is there ever a disagreement? What was the decision on the Dao Cyclops thing? Was that, <laughs> was that like something <laughs> that you guys fought over? To <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I was like 10 minutes before the deadline, I was practicing against Alchemy and I kept on getting my Dao's Mandrake. I was like, fuck this, I'm so done with this bullshit. And I put in the triple Dao's and then I drew all Dao's all over again in the testing afterwards and I was like, oh shit. Oh, so man. this is why people only play two dows. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, you could end. It's a, it's. I guess it's for a late game draw. Sometimes it can be not. Yeah, it, spectacular. It, it, it depends on whether people are planning on mandraking your dow. That's mm -hmm. just it. Whether you want because if you expect your opponent to mandrake one dow or even coral one, which sometimes they do, it's fine to have three dows. But if you just play them out, it's super shit. Yeah, six points tempo. <laughs> yeah, that's the stuff. We're talking about Dagon Deathwish that relies on the Dao, uh, aka Earth Elemental, being able to be procced by the Griffin, which procs Deathwish. So it's making Griffin, what is that, a solid? I always forget off the top of my head. It's a six, 17 points, 16 points, 17 points. Uh, so when, yeah, when you eliminate the Dao, um, you, first of all, uh, you completely, you, you brick the Griffin. Griffin just comes down at nine and uh, potentially uh, stop uh, Bruis from resing it as well because you've deleted it. So. Yeah. Um, the, the griffins are usually yeah. still able to hit the arc spores unless mm. uh, that would be 13 points still unless you are me then the arc spore all, only procs on slave driver so it's actually 10 points oh uh, yeah you had a little bit of, <laughs> there was a little bit of bad luck we can talk about this for a second that was one of the things you had to deal with where a little you had, bit <laughs> yeah you had um i think it was you where the Arcaspor, or no, actually, I think I'm in a different game. There was a different game where if Arcaspores hit a different number of Skellige units, their Berserkers yeah. would be stronger. That I was think the Tailbot for Sunshine right? yeah. game, yeah. That was Tailbot. Yeah, that was crazy. But Dutch Boy, you had a situation where um, Hannah Chan needed to, well, we talked about this in the cab. It wasn't as slim. It wasn't as slim as it seemed where Hannah Chan had to roll a Siege Tower to get out of that pass. Yeah. But it, you said it was like a pretty high percentage, right? It was something like. It was that yeah, or 80 plus or something. Like yeah. you had to get either uh, the, the, what he caught or the. What is it called? The battering ram. It's like battering. two out of what is it? Not that many machines even. It's like eight. It was actually guaranteed. It, it was, was actually guaranteed. guaranteed. Oh, okay. oh, wow. It was guaranteed because it was um, basically the uh, winch of uh, has uh, six different machines that it can offer, and if only two of these machines cannot achieve the uh, the score, there is still a third one that is being offered to you by winch. So there is a guaranteed that it's hundred percent that uh, he has. He has it, but uh, to be honest, he, like uh, there was another spot that was way more crucial than this mm -hmm. one, when um, Hanachan played uh, Gales into yeah. Spy and uh, that won him the game. Basically, versus Dutch Boy, that mm -hmm. won him the entire series. Because I don't, if he didn't hit that Frightener at this particular moment, he lost. Yeah, yeah. I do remember that part. And there was also it's um, a card game after all. Yeah. yeah, I mean we saw Adzikov's draws as well in one of his games where it's just like you're not going to get your done banners out and they're going to haunt you for the rest of your life <laughs> kind of situation with Henselt. Um, so I mean it does happen. There is RNG, of course. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I mean, uh, yeah, so 
we were talking about deck lists and how you brought the exact same deck list. Dutch boy, I wanted to get your your take on it. Um, well, you, I mean, you guys, I guess we covered it, right? You, you talked about why you had that one difference, but was there is there any moment in the preparation process where was there any big disagreements, or can one of you convince the other person? Yes. So basically, um, um, until I think one hour before the deadline, I was convinced or like or the morning before the deadline, I was convinced uh, that I would bring uh, boats Mm -hmm. because boats is just such a strong deck. And um, in on the last day, Dutch boy convinced me to uh, bring veterans because they're so good. Thankfully, they really performed in the tournament. But um, yeah, but uh, apart, I think it was still a good pick, and uh, a Dutch boy got a bit unlucky. I should have played it a slightly better. But uh, yeah, uh, in the in the last day, he, a Dutch boy really uh, really performed with the veterans deck, and he had a very different approach with the uh, with the spy in veterans, which was not played so popular before. Mm-hmm. And I really loved it. Yeah, so he convinced me there. And as far as the similar deck lists are concerned, so basically. When we we were prepping for a quite a long time together, and uh, we did a lot of testing, and kind of uh, it, during the process, you kind of uh, uh, converge to a strategy that you find optimal. And in the end, uh, if you prepped so much with the other person, it's kind of weird to say, "Hmm, I take totally different decks now." <laughs> it, it just doesn't make sense. So yeah. Yeah, we kind of went for the same lineup, and we were really hoping not to face each other in the beginning. And it actually could have happened in the semis if the wins and losses went differently. Um, Mm -hmm. So it would have been a very thorough mirror match for sure. Um, Dutch Boy, one of the things we talked about on uh, the day that we both arrived, I think, uh, we we had a chat about your lineup. I was just curious about what you intended to do. And you said you intended to uh, bring a lineup. uh, Of course, both of you brought these lineups. uh, Bring a lineup that makes alchemy struggle and with the intention of banning Henselt specifically. Um, first of all, just for anybody who doesn't know about, you know, why Henselt would be a top ban, which it was in the tournament, um, why is Henselt the ban target, generally? So, with the tournament format in the fixed coin flip, mean, it means that you just know when you're gonna get red coin and you're gonna get blue coin. Henselt is already a strong deck on the ladder, but if you know that you're gonna get that guaranteed red coin every single time, it's really, really strong. Mm-hmm. So, you either need to bring decks that are really good against it that can actually have a high shot at it like alchemy for example or you just have to get rid of it and since we didn't bring alchemy ourselves because we tar- we tried to target it it just didn't make sense to leave Hansel to open and give them a free win uh and demarcus what specifically about the lineup do you feel made alchemy struggle uh as a targeting strategy mm, basically uh, alchemy is best when it can destroy engines because um, a lot of decks can, um, uh, a lot of decks that use engines, they need to set their engines up to generate points. So, for example, boats. And um, if uh, alchemy can remove the engines, then uh, the deck really struggles and cannot generate the tempo to catch up with them. Mm-hmm. So we are thinking to bring decks that uh, do not run a lot of engines. And um, if you go over the different decks, veterans, they are pure power. They yeah. Uh, like uh, if you hit a unit with uh, your um, uh, with your Viper Witcher, it just does damage. It doesn't really do particularly much. Uh, with Dagon, if you hit Deathwish units, it uh, does damage, but it does damage to you back, or it, you just uh, kill the six point DAO, but there are eight point tokens now, and you literally achieved nothing. And uh, Bruva is uh, really strong because. Um, Bruva is a deck that is unlike that you want to play on red, and mm-hmm. Alchemy is also usually a deck that you don't want to play on blue, and um, so uh, we were and we don't we weren't really expecting to, that this matchup would happen very often, and if it would, uh, Al- uh, Square Tail is favored anyways because they have a lot of can they swarm the board kind of with their units and then they buff them, and uh, since the Viper Witchers are missing high value targets to hit, they cannot generate a lot of value. That's that's a really good way of looking at it. Um, and at the time where you were thinking about bringing boats, um, Alchemy functions a little bit better against boats. Was that uh, was that the ultimate, uh, was that part of the ultimate decision, Dutch Boy, uh, when you were pushing veterans, uh, that it was going to perform better against Alchemy? 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's that's most of it. The main problem was that, was that we had our uh, strategy prepared, trying to target Alchemy, and we had we still had to get some kind of blue coin deck because mm-hmm. you cannot only play red coins on this this format. It just doesn't work out for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And especially since Alchemy is most of the time a red coin deck, bringing boats against it on blue was just kind of too scary to begin mm-hmm. with. Mm-hmm. And veterans actually performed kind of well. They did good and made sense in our lineup with being stronger against uh, Alchemy. As well as at the time, uh, you could already start seeing this sh- uh, shift that Croc would become more popular than Bran. True, yeah. And it's it's actually interesting. Croc ended up being... Uh... Croc was was still popular. We actually saw more diversity in this in this Gwent Open from Skellige than we've seen in a really long time. Gwent Open number three, everybody brought very very similar brand Nova lists, whereas in this one we saw uh, almost every archetype Skellige can push represented. Uh, Tailbot kind of had a bear curse thing going on. Uh, of course, you were bringing uh, veterans. Hannah Chan brought great swords, and then of course there was Boats brand as well. About the great swords, though, because coming in from a Hensel targeting point of view, great swords. Uh, did it surprise you that Hannah Chan was playing great swords, Dutch boy? When you played against Hannah Chan in the semifinals, you ended up banning great swords and not Hensel. What was the decision there, and uh, did it did that ultimately? Uh, do you feel like Hannah Chan's uh, decision to bring great swords uh, overly affected your performance? Well, when we made the lineup, we were already kind of praying that people would just go with their comfort pick as in brand. Our lineup mm-hmm. wasn't going to be good against Greatsword anyway, and at that time, Greatsword didn't look that popular when we submitted the lineup. Um, Hannah Chen did make us... Well, Hannah Chen, Greatsword was a good deck to bring against the decks that we brought, and it, could ha- it, it was really good for him. Now we had to ban it, and it got... Uh, it went 1-0 against the Morcus, so like that's the kind of deck you want to have. Mm-hmm. But it could have also struggled a lot against other lineups. The fa- the fact that Alchemy was so popular and also Greatsword isn't that that great of a blue coin deck made it so that we didn't really want to bring it. But like if you get the right matchups with Greatswords and especially with the power the deck has shown to have right now, it could be good to bring in your lineup. It just didn't make sense for us. Yeah, I mean, if you if you get an opponent who really does know how to play the Barclay into Cleaver combo against Greatswords, <laughs> then Greatswords are obviously really great. Mm. But, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, we were also f- talking on the first day about uh, Hannah Chamber and Greatswords, and uh, he... Uh, he kind of got lucky to end up in our part of the bracket with his lineup. Uh, I think mm-hmm. because uh, he would have uh, with this with great swords, he would have taken a beating against some opponents, uh, especially the ones who were very uh, confident in their alchemy mm-hmm. uh, gameplay. But um, in the end, um, he was ahead of the he was ahead of the competition because he brought great swords first, and no one else did, and it paid out for him. And great swords. Uh... We were talking about um, practicing with deck lists that you confirm ahead of time and how you're kind of playing on a meta that's, what is it, two weeks ahead? You have to submit two weeks ahead? One week. One week. Okay. So metas can change pretty drastically in a week. Great Swords were actually, uh, they got popular around, uh, before and around the Open, I think maybe at the beginning of the week. They might even still be popular for for all I know, but um, they weren't super popular uh, or popular enough that people were playing it so much you said it comfort zone with brand people have been playing brand boats for mm. a very long time so um it's interesting that that you know there's different sort of meta bubbles out there and hannah chan being uh in a different part of the world um just kind of that's just what his practice and his and his experience brought him so uh, really interesting stuff. Generally, though, how do you feel about the tournament format? Now you've been through you've been through the process. Pro ladder. We did talk about a little bit about pro ladder, so we don't need to go too much into that. But the tournament process in general, um, the two day format, the uh, the brackets, um, the fixed coin, maybe specifically, or even conquest format. I'd like to know, uh, coming from from you guys, how you feel about that, Demorcus. What do you, how do you feel about that generally? Mm, I, I really loved it. I think the fixed coin is one of the best uh, in, in, like inventions in the tournament format because it uh, allows you to um, tailor very specifically to your needs. You know that you will be playing on red. You you know that you will be uh, 
what what opponent your line what lineup your opponent has and uh, with this red blue uh, rule you can really anticipate in what order your opponent will pick the decks and mm -hmm. it brings a whole uh, new uh, way of uh, planning your uh, strategy i love it and uh, like apart from that the tournament was also a great experience in form of uh, playing mm -hmm. because um, the decks i mean in the end the decks uh, didn't seem to pay off because veterans lost uh, both of us the series but um, i mean dutch boy got a bit unlucky it, it happens in card games mm -hmm. and i uh, also um kind of lost my strategy in the veterans game but yeah I mean, it's it's really fascinating that you can bring archetypes that are not present at the ladder at all like veterans with mm -hmm. spy it hasn't seen any play and then they suddenly become viable in a special setting Dutch boy what, what about your your side of it so my opponent is actually somewhat different uh, my opinion is somewhat different here I don't necessarily like the fixed coin flip in the way it is now it's good that it's always guaranteed three on two blue red, but the fact that you know when you're gonna get it is somewhat annoying to practice and to uh, mm. see as well. Like, mm. I'm not really as interested in seeing Hansel on red every single time again or Brewer on red. It's interesting when their game plan kind of fills and you have to see them shift their game plan and the strategy because they didn't get what they want. Mm -hmm as well as for practicing, it's so annoying to need a certain coin to be able to practice a matchup. I've re I've had days where I just had to concede for 30 minutes straight because I kept on winning the coin flip where I had to lose it. <laughs> and that was really stupid. That's so weird. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it, I won as the coin well flip as... again. <laughs> you know, yeah. no one ever. Shit! <laughs> as well as just uh, preparing for the tournament, your preparation will be different. Like, we... Uh, I, at least for myself, I think the markets as well, like we almost didn't prepare brew from blue at all. Mm. Like preparing for a tournament uh, is just a lot less skillful in that sense that you only need to prepare your decks on half of the coins. Like the matchup changes when the coin flip changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's interesting. There's actually a really, a really I have to call this out in the chat, a really awesome uh solution here from Kochua saying uh, that a great solution to this would be whoever issues the challenge in a friend match goes first or at least that's a, something you could toggle so then you'd know that if you issue the challenge you go first and then you could always set it up like that hopefully in the future of competitive via observer mode or whatever rolls out to give you know a little bit more to the competitive scene by way of UI and functionality I hope that there is like a switch that can be turned on and off to uh to simulate this uh this elaborate system they have in place for the open where they basically like kind of hack it so they just can always kind of hack the coin uh it's pretty interesting if the coin was not fixed my next question how much would it affect your preparation dutch boy do you think it would be easier to prepare because you're more likely when you're pre when you're preparing the random coin flip would mean you could you wouldn't have to throw away any games or would it be harder to prepare because you could end up with five blue coins potentially uh, I think it would actually be easier to prepare. I mean, it, it kind of depends on how you're feeling skill-wise uh, compared to the competition. Mm -hmm. Since you can basically make the decision uh, before the game starts whether you're better than your opponent has, or not, at least in your head. Since if you're not feeling confident, you can just bring only red coin decks, win every coin flip and win anyway. Mm -hmm. So that would make it more interesting. But, like... It makes the strategy a whole lot different. You probably wouldn't have been as many Brewers, for example, as there were now, because mm -hmm. you you just didn't always get the red coin that makes the deck so strong. Right on. Demarcus, what do you think? Uh, I would agree. I think it uh, would have made the, um, the decks that have been brought to the open less diverse, mm -hmm. because uh, when you don't know uh, what coin to expect in a tournament, um, you're almost in the pro ladder setting you basically have to queue a game and you have to win the game and then you just bring the strongest decks and then you have to kind of of course the additional part is spanning a deck and targeting and stuff but it take like not taking the coin flip away would take a lot of the strategy away and i wouldn't like it i think i like that uh, the coin is there and it's fixed because then it offers a lot of variety of decks for example carryover decks uh, to, on red and stuff like this like 
tail the tailboard strategy or uh, queuing with uh, with good blue coin decks into uh, favorable matchups on red coin mm -hmm. uh, that like that's what basically what we did for example alchemy on red is obviously very strong but it's definitely less strong if you queue with dagon on blue into it and can dry past them so uh, it takes a lot of the strategy away and uh, also, this was this is kind of news, but and this isn't on the show notes. But I just remembered that uh, Rafal uh, Rafal Yaki of CDPR tweeted that they may consider. Uh, they're just floating an idea out there that may they may give leaders an initiative stat, which would actually dictate the coin in any given matchup. Just off the top of your head, I don't know if you even heard of this tweet or if you even heard that this was being decided. Mm -hmm. But off the top of your head, gut reaction to that. What do you think, Dutch boy? I really had mixed feelings about this because it would just shake up the meta a lot. Mm -hmm. In that, let's say we're playing uh, Dagon Deathwish. Dagon isn't necessarily a must for the archetype. So if Dagon has a really shitty initiative and let's say Unseen Elder is actually really fast and will always, or I don't know how they will exactly do it, but let's say Unseen Elder always gets red coin. I'm just yeah. going to switch my leader around and get that red coin for sure. As well as... Um, the same thing I said about the fixed coin flip, it will it will lower the matchup diversity in that you'll always have certain matchups with certain coins. Like the coin flip changes how you play certain matchups. Uh, a big example is against Hansel, because mm -hmm. you can not really push Hansel really hard in round one because of the dumb banner. You can never get more than 20 stats ahead. Mm -hmm. But with uh, the fixed coin, you always know how it's going to go and you always know how the matchup is going to play out. But on the other hand, it would make the coin flip less RNG and less annoying to play as because you just know what's going to happen and you can change your strategy about it. If you want the red coin really bad, you can make your leader a bit worse to get that red coin. It's interesting. I wonder how they would actually augment the factions uh, if you kind of knew. Like if they, there was a faction that had, I guess, let's just make the assumption that the lowest initiative is the one that goes second, just because I feel like that's easier to understand as opposed to, even sure. though going second is what you want, the value I imagine the lower the better. Um, but whatever faction has the leader with the lowest initiative, like how do you go ahead and plan around that when there's two other leaders to also balance with initiative? I'm worried that it's not, it's not uh, so easy. You'd have to give, you'd have to give it to the whole faction and that drastically would affect other leaders as well. I don't know. Demarcus, what's your hot take on it? Mm, first of all, I like that they are considering ideas to, um, to approach the coin flip and they see that it is an issue. Mm -hmm. So um, props to that, but uh, of course uh, I would agree with Dutch Boy. I'm very skeptical about the initiative um, um, use because uh, at some point you would just trade coin flip for leader ability, and I'm not sure if that's a desirable trade off to introduce to Gwent mm -hmm. because as, as uh, Dutch Boy said, some of the archetypes don't really rely on um, on the leader. You could also play reveal with Calvid. Mm -hmm. It would still suck, but <laughs> you could also play, um, I know, uh, Mulligan Elves with Francesca, you, or you could play Dagon Deathwish with uh, Whispering Killock. And mm -hmm. I mean, it, the, arc, the gameplay wouldn't change too much. So I am very skeptical about it. I think it would need uh, some kind of more sophisticated uh, approach to fix it. Couldn't say it any better. I agree. Uh, also, shout out to Adzikov in the chat, by the way. Shout out to all of you in the chat. I see you guys, Dr. Gerd Greyboxer, all of you. Um, so uh, I guess I guess that's pretty good. I'm glad that I had a chance to talk to you guys about Gwent Open. Any any final uh, any final comments about the Gwent Open experience and how you're gonna get back into Gwent next time there's a chance to qualify? Uh, Dutch boy, you can head off first. Yeah, I mean, I would like to go there again and actually make it to the finals this time. <laughs> and so I've I've learned a lot from the experience itself, Pro Letter and the tournament, and would probably do it somewhat differently the next time, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And Demarcus? Well, I already uh, talked with Andy Wand about it, so we both are going to qualify for the Open, and I'm going to <laughs> take a shot for every misplay I make, so I'm sure I will play the finals completely sober. <laughs> Uh, Andy Wine's hilarious. Uh, I met him at Gwen Slam 2. I think it was Gwen Slam number 2. Uh, he's a great guy. Uh, your team is full of great people, by the way. Um, thanks. All right. So, uh, speaking I of great people... I was going to say thanks now. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, you may have been an honorary member, right? Um, uh, speaking of great people in the chat, there are some people in the chat. If you have any questions for uh, the competitive mind of LB Dutch Boy or Demorcus or questions in general about Gwent, uh, feel free to put it in the chat. We'd love to talk to you uh, after the community break here. Um, but generally, though, I actually have a question for you guys. Outside of Gwent, you know, you just had that high intensity Gwent, uh, that high intensity Gwent of Gwent Open. Uh, you maybe want to take a break. What games are you guys playing? Uh, what games do you guys play normally? Maybe when you're looking to maybe have a less uh, less intensity in your life. So yeah, I, I'm playing some Vermintide 2 now with friends, as well as some D&D if I have the chance. Mm -hmm. That's always cool. Uh, and just some relaxed games like Civilization or whatever there is out there. Sometimes a bit of relaxation is not too bad, especially yeah. if you're trying to play a lot of games of Gwent in one day. Mm -hmm. You need to be stay a bit relaxed. How about you, Demarcus? What's your what's your jam? Mm, I think my jam is kind of the RPGs. Although, uh, like one of my favorite games, also Bio the Bioshock series, mm -hmm. it was really great. Uh, but apart from that, um, I think for two years now, almost uh, when I don't play Gwent or when I don't play uh, any games in general, I try to do other stuff or learn um, new things. For example, I tried sailing recently. Oh, cool! Um, so basically, I'm I'm less actually the computer gamer than uh, doing other stuff. But of course, I'm a really good FIFA player. Ah. So um, Panda has to get his revenge yeah. next time. <laughs> yeah, Panda is always looking for people to play FIFA with when we go to these <laughs> things. Absolutely, he's a fiend for FIFA. All right, uh, we're gonna hop into the uh, to the community section here, and we're gonna talk to the chat. Uh, so we have some questions coming in uh, for uh, the gentlemen and in general. I'll talk to you guys after this. Once again, we are supported by our commandos, our patrons at patreon.com slash commandershorn. We welcome our newest commanders, Dr. Gurr, Necro Dan, and Brian D. Thanks so much for supporting our content, keeping the podcast ad-free. Questions coming in from the chat. Dutch Boy, you mentioned being extra stressed while streaming, but you decided to start streaming after the open. Does that mean you enjoyed the stress from the open? The question comes in from <laughs> Dr. Gurr. <laughs> well, that's not necessarily how it worked into my head, but... I have wanted to start streaming for a while now. I kind of wanted to see how the experience would be. And this was kind of my best chance to do it since I have some name right now after the Open. Mm. And I know how the meta is right now. So, yeah, streaming seemed like a good decision for me as well as it being uh, somewhat more fun to play than uh, Pro Letter all day. That's cool. Um, DeMarcus, I'll throw this one to you. Uh, as a competitive player, this one comes from uh, Molegion. As a competitive player, what do you think about the current pro system? Would you change anything? If so, what? And I'm thinking that Molegion is talking about the pro ladder or qualification process for these events. Well, that's that's a big one. Mm -hmm. and, it's a big uh, one. I think, uh, yeah, I think um, well, what I've been always a big uh, supporter of is... Um, basically uh, opening, like lowering the entry barriers for tournament play. I know it's it's a big thing to ask and it's it's not easy to achieve, but mm -hmm. I, I think that when I looked at the re, uh, race for the top spots on the pro ladder last season, mm -hmm. it, it was insane how many good people competed uh, and Game King, Gwen to Town, Gluten Snake, o Octopus, all of mm -hmm. them didn't make it and they played a great season. And so, so I would hope to see more chances for uh, the players who are missing top eight um, to uh, get the chance to participate in tournaments. And uh, I, w I hope that uh, we will uh, some sometime this year or sometime next year see a bit bigger tournaments with more faces. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing rotating faces, but there's only ever eight slots. So sometimes it's just you have to like, you know, good players don't make it in. And when you know how good some of these players are, it feels like a crime. I mean, obviously, I've seen Game King compete a lot. It is uh, and not taking away from anybody who does uh, who does qualify. But uh, Game King not being at an event is always feels very strange because uh, he's been at so many of them already. Uh, question coming in from... Uh, 
uh, Henote, uh, Dutch boy. How does it feel to be the best Dutch Gwent player? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it feels pretty good, right? Coming from another ditch guy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm hoping that there will actually become some more ditch players in a bigger Dutch community, because at the moment there isn't really that much going on. Yeah. But I would love to have some uh, more LAN events and tournaments here that promote Gwent in our land as well. Yeah, I mean, as a Canadian, or even as a North American, I hear you. <laughs> uh, having some more representation would be cool. Uh, I think if I was on the pro ladder, I could be the best. They're like top 200, no Canadians. What's going on, guys? Come on, let's get let's get this Feels together. Um, <laughs> Apero in the chat, maybe you know Apero. Um, <laughs> any new recruits to either of your teams? Kappa, Demorcus, I think I think we know what she's <laughs> looking to she's looking to get out of this. That's 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 <laughs> kind of an insider, yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah, we Apero joined our team recently, very recently, yesterday. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, she's uh, she's a great streamer. Check her out. Yeah, Apero. I, I think she wow. was she was. Uh, there was a trial of the grasses tournament at one point. Uh, it was called the trial of the grasses tournament. It took place mostly off stream, and I don't believe it was ever broadcast. But I and and I was going to be casting it, but since it never occurred, I didn't really look into it uh, as much. And I think that it may have actually gone up to YouTube. The point is, uh, <laughs> Apero was in the finals of that, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, yes, was... she tweeted at me uh, just just so just so I she <laughs> it was a great tweet. She's like, just so you know, when you're casting my games, say she because I'm a girl. <laughs> she didn't want <laughs> she didn't want to be called he. Uh, I'm not sure if that's been happening, but it is. You know, it's the gamer space, right? So, anyway, I know Apero. Thanks for joining the chat, Apero. Your team won. Oh, your team won. See, I didn't even know because I didn't get a chance to look at any of the video or even see them. I like to go in blind uh, when it's pre-recorded, so I didn't look into that. Well, there you go. A god of advertising. Oh, I know a little bit about that. Um, oh, you have... Oh, Bojima PC is also Dutch. Yeah, I have, there's a lot of Dutch people, I think, in my chat that ha hang out. So, so hello hello from, from the Netherlands to everybody. Yo, hello, everyone. Guys, yeah, uh, cool. I think there was one other... Was there one other question here? There was one question. See for yourself is... That, I don't know if this is a real question, but asking when is full test good? So this is... Maybe we can expand this question to underplayed uh, leaders in a tournament setting. I think it's probably just because Henseld's performance on the red coin is so undeniably strong that there's no other Northern Realms leaders that have a chance to compete. But in the ladder or in the pro ladder, is is full full test falling behind? And why do you think why do you think full test is falling behind? I mean, Henseld has more tools right now mm -hmm. and more uh, like their their uh, what is it called? Their plan comes together more often than not. Like, even if Hansel fails horribly at its plan, you, you still get this uh, Bloody Baron at the end, which is 20 points. The Dumb Baron are always a dick to play around, and it's just a hard deck to win against. Mm -hmm. While Full Test often can just fail on its own or have other problems. Like, you always have the problem of Full Test being a low tempo play mm -hmm. that you need to get rid of somehow. Plus, if you want to play full test, you kind of want to play more units, which requires more um, thinning and bricks potentially. Like I've played some of the huge bird deck on my stream, and huge bird. Well, it's it's an interesting experience to play. Like some games, you just auto win because your hand's godlike and mm -hmm. it's the best deck ever, and some games you just auto lose because your hand is super awful. Yeah, I mean, I like full test. Uh, full test has I like running the armor list as well. Puts the aspirants out of zap range. That's kind of cool. Um, the full test armor list I think performs better. Full test army with field medics is also pretty cool, but I think maybe its short round is is not that great. I don't know, Demorcus. Have you ever? Have, what's the, uh, maybe this is a better question? I'm gonna reframe this question, Demorcus. Do you have like a a guilty pleasure leader, like a leader that you just really <laughs> love playing, even though maybe you don't think it's always that good, but you have more fun with it? It's actually Foltest. I mean, Foltest oh, is good. my favorite leader in the game. And uh, because he was such an awesome character in the Witcher games, mm -hmm. um, I really like Tamaria. So uh, mm. I think um, that he's just a little weak, to be honest. I mean, he just... Uh, there are, like, one of the my favorite archetypes with uh, uh, Foltest was the one with the Kedwin Knights, I believe. And then you would pull them with Dijkstra and... Um, and uh, Stannis, and you would uh, hyper thin your deck with the Blue Mountain Scouts. That mm -hmm. was a really good one, but it's uh, just uh, too too little power. But I think um, that when the meta will shift a bit to um, Dagon to weather decks, 
um, that Hansard will come back. And um, I think that the armor list from Hansard has still a lot of power. Um, mm -hmm. I I tried out a bit. Um, I tried it out a bit recently, uh, uh, like a pure armor list with the heavy cavalry, with the Redanian elites, and it was actually working quite well. But um, it's um, it worked well because people uh, underestimate the high roll potential of the deck in the last round. It can generate uh, really a lot of points, but it's mm -hmm. also, as I said, high roll. So. Yeah. Um, but it's a cool deck. I think it's an archetype that doesn't see play because Hensel is so strong and you would rather get your pro leader points with Northern Realms with Hensel, but uh, but Foltis is not dead. Not dead yet. Yeah, I mean, I remember the old full test. He used to copy a bronze unit. Just make a copy of it on the board. So you could copy a Reaver Scout, Reaver Scout again, or copy a Reinforced Trebuchet and just have two Trebs on the board. And I wonder if, like, the game has seen so many shifts and changes and balances and, and power has risen and bronzes and leaders have gone up in power. Would it be so broken to bring that ability back into the game? This isn't a general question. I'm just, I'm asking the world. Maybe, maybe you guys could tweet <laughs> at Commander's Horn. Let me know if you think that Full Test's old ability of copying, making a copy of a bronze unit on the board would be too strong today because I kind of miss it. I used to, I was a closed beta superstar with Full Test. I loved that deck that uh, just basically thinned like crazy. It was a totally different deck. Field Medics rezzed. It was a totally different deck. But I think the healthiest way to do it mm -hmm. is what to um, to allow Hansel, uh, Foltest to spawn a copy of a bronze unit and give Reaver Hunters the old ability back, the trio ability that they hit for half of the power. Because oh, no. Reaver Hunters was amazing. Was... I loved that deck. I hated that deck. <laughs> really. <laughs> and I didn't like even the casting of the tournament where that was most popular. I think it was Gwent. It actually might have been Gwent uh, Open number one, the one that happened at Gamescom. I think that, that was that that was a super stale time where Hens it was a Tencelt brand and whatever the Scoyatella jam was, and that's like all we ever saw. I didn't like I hated I hated Reaver Hunters so much. <laughs> I hated Reaver Hunters more than Axemen, I think, when Axemen were at their most toxic. Jesus, that's harsh. Actually, I don't. maybe now I don't even know. Sometimes I forget how strongly <laughs> I hated stuff. It depends on what I was also playing at the time. <laughs> I could have been playing the counter to Axemen if there no, was No, I one. mean, uh, uh, Reaver Hunters were always a bit uh, powerful, and but I would like to see them uh, come back. I mean, at that time when you played Reaver Hunters, what happened to you is basically you queued into Dagon and you were... Uh, you lost the games by Becca's Tilted Mirror. And, oh, uh, man, that then... card sucked too. <laughs> <laughs> or you uh, you queued into Discard Skellige, and then it was for Hemdal or whatever Dona, Dona said, stealing yeah. your Rust Reaver Hunter from the deck, and you were like, this is my life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, man, it's so crazy. Like Those were like defining, defining moments of that metagame that just are completely mm -hmm. gone. Now we have, you know, there's always something that seems to be on people's minds. So, I mean, we'll always remember those with fondness or no fondness. You seem to miss Reaver Hunters. I don't really. But, yeah, Operator's <laughs> way too slow now. There's lots of what things that are holding Reaver Hunters back. But I don't think it's that trio ability. Ugh, I don't know. That trio ability was devastating. But was it more <laughs> devastating than Siri Nova, I wonder? Was it so much worse? It was bronze. It was, you could really, it was consistent too, so. It was fun. Yeah, it was fun. You could say it's fun. <laughs> That's a good play. That's a good way to wrap it up. Remembering Gwent <laughs> is a fun game. <laughs> Dutch boy doesn't agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, guys, uh, we'll wrap it up here. I thought this was a great podcast. Thanks so much for coming and talking competitive with me and with the chat here. Um, Dutch boy, you're streaming now. Where can people find you uh, out there on Twitch, on Twitter, uh, whatever you get up to when you're not just playing Gwent? Uh, yeah, my stream and just simply LB Dutch boy. Mm -hmm. And for Twitter, it's sector one underscore LB Dutch boy. If you want to find me there, that's sector one, like you spell it the whole word. No, uh, it's S one. Excuse me, sorry. S one underscore <laughs> Dutch boy or LB Dutch boy. LB Dutch boy. There you go. Just want to make it extra clear because people should be following, uh, following their favorite Gwent players um, that are out there on the screen. Demarcus, what about you? Where can people find you um, out there? And anything else you want to promote or give shout outs as well? Yes, um, so basically I think uh, I have a Twitter account as well. It's uh, just the Marcus. Um, you can follow me there, but I think the best way to get in touch with me is over my team. And we have a great public Discord. 
um, that's uh, that's really active and helpful. So it's one of the best places, uh, the best place in Gwent to uh, uh, to uh, basically get in touch with other players and uh, improve. And um, also on the webpage uh, timaratusa.com. And as I'm speaking of the webpage, we have a new pick and ban tool now, which is great for tournaments. So you don't have to uh, kind of hope that you uh, send your ban at the same time anymore. And uh, hmm. as far as shout outs are concerned, I wanted to give a shout out to um, Kachna, who is one of our earliest members. And he's the one that uh, built the homepage for, for us from the scratch. And he's done great work from the team. So uh, thanks for the work you've done for the team, Kachna. Also, Dutch Boy, I didn't really say shout out. I give you a shout out opportunity. Was there a shout out that you wanted to give as well, Dutch Boy? Uh, I mean, like the same thing that I said at the open, like Artus helped me a lot with the preparations as well as my own teammates and as well as my family, which is also really important. I'm just this young kid that has been playing card games from the age of 14, <laughs> 15 that was sent to France and England and all that, even to China without with my parents' consent, which is something hard to get, but eventually earned. Right on. <laughs> All right, well, it was great having you guys. Again, uh, these are your Gwent Open number three participants and uh, hopefuls uh, for the future of Gwent Competitive. Um, hoping to meet you guys again in person. Uh, as for me, I can be found at McBeardCH on Twitter, McBearded on Twitch, and McBeard on YouTube, uh, where my latest video was all about the challenges that I had with my chat, which in, in, resulted in me shaving my beard. I'll put the link for the video <laughs> in the show notes. It's, uh, it's a fun time, of course, as all fight nights are. Uh, but that'll be it. Find us on Twitter at Commander's Horn. Let us know how you feel about Full Test's old ability, because maybe we can talk about it on the next episode. <laughs> or you can email us directly at commandershornpodcast at gmail.com. It was great to have you guys on. Thanks so much again. And thanks to everybody in the chat uh, for hanging out with us. And uh, until next time, everyone, best of luck on the path. Thanks for having us. Thank you, man.